Swill Season Surf Radio is recorded by the Newsstand Studio at Rockefeller Center in the heart of Manhattan and is distributed by Wax.Radio. Hi, and welcome to Swell Season Surf Radio. I'm your host, Karen Song, and I am so excited to finally share this interview from June of this year, where I had the absolute pleasure and honor of chatting with surf legend Pauline Menser. She is one of the subjects, heroines, and stars of the documentary feature film, Girls Can't Surf, that premiered and headlined in New York at this year's Women's Surf Film Festival in Rockway. And if you missed it, I urge you to find it and watch it immediately. Also, check out our previous Swell Season interview with the film's director, Chris Neelius, for some insightful contextual background. Girls Can't Surf features Pauline and a generation of rebellious female surfers of the 80s and 90s who chased their passion to surf against all odds and change the sport forever. Pauline Menser grew up in the rough-and-tumble Bondi Beach of the 70s, fought her way through aggressive all-male lineups to become a professional surfer in the 80s and 90s. In 1993, she won the world title, and in her career, she has won more competitions than any other female surfer second only to Lane Beachley. She was ultimately inducted into the Australian Surfing Hall of Fame. The list of her surf achievements go on and on, but it's her story as an underdog of epic proportions that's astounding and wooing fans decades later, worldwide. The sacrifices she made when facing and fighting insurmountable odds, namely sexist and homophobic in nature, to surf at the highest level with uncompromising integrity, passion, perseverance, and true grit that makes her an important pioneer in surfing. She paved the way for the evolution of the sport towards greater gender equality. Her story is also about a pure love and commitment to surfing, tested in ways unimaginable. For all the injustices Pauline endured throughout her career while making history, epitomized by the fact that in the year she won the world title, there was no prize money. Outraged fans of the film started a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for what would have been Pauline's prize money. The campaign became a viral sensation and its fundraising goals were far surpassed. But in classic Pauline style of generosity and the desire to help others, she took only the funds that were raised for her to pay for the medicines she direly needed and gave the overflow of funds to other charities to help others who were in need. She is the definition of a class act. about what that was like to see this crowdsource funding and the reception that uh, the film received? For me to get any recognition, even though it's it's late, was just absolutely wonderful because you know, the last two years have been really unwell. And at one stage, when I was first diagnosed with my illness, mm-hmm. it's called Pimpticus vulgaris. I, I thought that I was going to die because mm-hmm. that was the prognosis without mm-hmm. medicine. It's like if you don't take high-dose steroids, will have immune suppressants, mm. um, you have a very high chance of dying. And so, you know, when that happens, you think, okay, I'm going to look over my life and what happened. And I was thinking about my whole surfing career and thinking, man, I felt like I did so much for surfing and, and really haven't got much recognition. Mm-hmm. And during that time of being unwell, we started doing the filming. And when I saw that they started flying the other girls in from America, I thought, wow, I think this movie is going to do really well. Mm-hmm. And then finally, when it was released to us, we didn't get to see it till probably a month before the Australian release. Mm-hmm. I was blown away at how good it was and how well it told the story. Mm-hmm. And it just made me feel proud. And I was so happy to finally get the recognition and also really happy to know that um, the story of from each and every one of us has inspired different people for different things that they have right. going on in their life mm-hmm. and the amount of emails I've had of thank you so much and you know like I've got autoimmune and now I feel like I need to really get off the lounge and do stuff because look what you did Mm. and then also a parent messaged me saying that her son went to the school and said 
what are you doing for us gay kids at the school? Like, you don't mm-hmm. have anything for us. Amazing. And she said Amazing. he was totally inspired from the movie. Mm-hmm. And that kid saw it once and actually asked his mum to see it again. Amazing. And so hearing, I've actually had hundreds of stories like that and hearing how much it's inspired people, mm-hmm. it's just been so, so good. And um, I've actually done never-ending interviews, but I'm trying to do <laughs> all of them because... Like <laughs> Yeah, if there's one person that you can inspire, it's all worth it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have you received any kind of um, words of support from the professional surfers who are competing now? Um, I know that Stephanie Gilmore was um, really championing this film, but I wondered if anyone had personally reached out to you. In the the women's side of things, Stephanie Gilmore, Sally Fitzgibbons, I didn't Mm. see too many of the other girls share it, which I was really surprised. Wow. Wow. yeah, I was really surprised, but I did hear that the the girls that did see it really loved it, mm-hmm. and especially the younger generation, the younger pro girls or amateur girls really coming through, they were all really excited about it. Right. Um, the guys, some of the guys that said those silly comments in the movie, <laughs> yes. really, you know, and they all happen to have girls now, which I find ironic. Oh, that's great. Um, we're really apologetic. Oh. Gary Elkerton rung me up himself and said, you know, <laughs> I was a dickhead back then and I don't think like that now. And um, <laughs> wonderful. what's really lovely is lots of fathers have been coming up to me and saying, mm-hmm. you know, thank you for paving the way. There's nothing mm-hmm. more special to me than surfing with my daughter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, out of seriously hundreds of messages and just seeing people's reactions through others, I've only had one negative feedback through all of that. And that was just someone that was homophobic. Oh, boy. That's, by the way, happy Pride. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> have pride Month in Australia, but in the States, it's Pride. Yeah, ours is in March. All right, for Mardi Gras. Yes. Oh, I, that's unfortunate. But there's always, you know, as you guys use this word very uh, liberally, dickhead, which is such a great word. <laughs> uh, there's always one in the lot. But um, that's really beautiful to hear such a warm kind of reception of the film. I think it's really interesting to see this new generation um especially of the men with daughters. It's amazing to see that shift because of those really sexist attitudes prior. But then when you have a daughter and you love your daughter and you want to see your daughter thrive in the world and not be treated like shit, um, you know, things shift. It becomes very personal. Exactly. And it's really incredible to see in Australia, the Groms for groomed to be professionals. There are more girls than boys. That wouldn't surprise me. Like, the other day, some, one of my friends was out in the water at Wadigos and they looked around and they said, oh, wow, like they gave a big fist pump because there was so many girls out there and there was one guy. <laughs> so it's, it's really nice to see that it's, um, you know, it's the, the guys have finally accepted that the women are out there and, and they mm. realise that it's actually a mellow, a way more mellow crowd. So right. they've embraced it <laughs> and... Um, I find that the only people that really are against it or, or see stupid remarks on mm-hmm. online are normally people who aren't very well educated yeah 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 I think so or just the crabby old white men <laughs> who, who yeah, you know can't change their mind yeah. <laughs> um I wanted to talk about your roots. I know you grew up in Bondi and that's where you surfed in your early years. And it's really hard to imagine, you know, even with the sexist attitudes of the film, even just to imagine what Bondi was like then, given what it's like now, you know, it's very kind of fancy, you know, and I think its roots um, were very different in your time. Can you kind oh, totally. of take us back to it's It reminds me of, you know, I grew up in New York City in the 70s and I really related to a lot of the, a lot of your story yeah so I guess like you know when I started surfing was um early 80s and Mm -hmm. it was really like it was known for being called scum valley Mm -hmm. because it was quite scummy they used to have the sewage going out in the water right in the middle of the beach (laughs) um there was tons and tons of homeless there was Mm -hmm. a lot of people coming and living from New Zealand Mm -hmm. and it was really pretty rough Mm -hmm. and even like every time I went surfing guys would say, you know, get out of the water, grommet. This is not a girl's place. And Mm. so then I ended up being quite happy to look like a little boy, Mm -hmm. you know, cut my hair really short. And then I didn't get picked on or noticed when I looked like a little boy. Uh (laughs) But, you know, I'd also hear lots of really awful stories of like, 
you know, back then it was like cool to attack women and, and yeah. all this kind of stuff that, you know, really horrible stuff that as a young girl hearing that and them not knowing there's a girl sitting behind them really shocked me and scared me. Mm-hmm. And I realised how um, I can open my eyes to how people can seem, you know, like this wonderful front, but then mm-hmm. you hear the stories that come out of their mouth. I think, wow, there's some really awful people out there. Right. And so um, I guess it taught me to be tough. And mm-hmm. so I really latched onto the people that supported me and just completely ignored the ones that were, you know, nasty or rough. Mm-hmm. Like I used to get kicked, kicked in the stomach and told to get out of the water. That's how rough it was. Wow. And so, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess growing up with three brothers helped as well because they were pretty tough on me. Mm-hmm. And so I learned to stick up for myself. Yeah, you see that, you know, I I was interviewing Caroline Marks and, you know, she grew up with all these brothers and it seems like growing up with brothers gives you another level of edge. But I think um, the kind of environment bond I was back then was really um, a lot to kind of test you and and grow from. Um, also, yeah, you, be- you, become, you become very street aware. Like I remember mm-hmm. even this yeah. old man that was always flashing himself in the bush and I was like, <laughs> God. You know, that kind of was normal back then. Right. <laughs> and then I remember telling this runner, like I was walking along between Bondi and Bronte, mm-hmm. and I remember t- telling this runner, like this old man keeps flashing at me. Oh, jeez. And then he said, oh, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And then I walked back and saw him beating the crap out of him. And I'm like, oh, you didn't have to do that. And he <laughs> says, yeah, but he was flashing at you. And I s- said, was it was it that bad? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Because you kind of mm-hmm. get used to right. those sort of things. And he's like, yeah, yeah. that's really, really bad. Right. I went, okay, I guess he deserves it then. Right, right. Actually, I want to go back to Bondi again, but that kind of segues like this idea of not knowing when you're so used to something um, and you don't know that it could be any different or that it should be any different. You know, I think about every new generation of girls who come to surfing or to just every new generation. Um, they don't know what was in the past. You know, in the film in your day, um, the way the women's competitions were like relegated to the worst conditions and were referred to as the lunch break. And, you know, and as soon as the conditions would clean up, they would you know, shuffle the women off and get the men back in and get their competition going. And then, you know, that happened, that was never ending. That happened all the time. And there's so many stories that we could tell you where that say, okay, the women are on in an hour. So Mm -hmm. we'd sit there waiting around for the hour and then it would still be good. So they're like, oh no, we've moved it till to one. And then all of a sudden, so you'd leave the beach. And then Mm -hmm. this, I'll never forget in France one time, this young girl comes running down the beach and she goes, Pauline, you're on. And I said, oh, they told us that we're on at one. And she goes, no, they've changed it again. Unbelievable. And so be- they used to say to us that we had to wait around the contest area. So mm. if we missed our heat, it was too bad. Oh, my goodness. So you can imagine if you're trying to stay in right, top focus. Right. Of course. And then you have to wait around at the contest all day. Mm-hmm. And that happened so much. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't until there was a couple of events where there was not even waves ridden. Mm-hmm. and so that's when they decided to do that whole restart mm-hmm. where if there's not a wave ridden in the first 10 minutes they'll restart the heat which is a fantastic idea but it happened because we're getting thrown out in such crappy surf that they realized you know we need to do something again to make this um you know still contestable it feels like those changes were starting to shift only a few years ago you know and to see that that you guys also fought for that, fought against that in your time. And it took that long for things to finally kind of shift. You know, I remember seeing one event, you know, big wave surf um, WSL event, and it was at Jaws and the men had like the most amazing conditions. And then after the men's event was were the women's event, it was like high tide. The winds were howling offshore. I mean, just howling. And it, you could see the women were struggling. The men would have struggled. And, you know, just to see the comments of these idiots who are like, you see, women can surf and da da da. And it's like, but the same thing again was happening. And this was just a few years exactly. ago. Exactly. And um, even well, the thing, thing that was nice was, um, you know, each year I go to the, the banquet where they do the crowning of the world champion. And I get to actually see people like Stephanie Gilmore and, and catch up with them. And she was saying, you know, a couple of years before they had the equal prize money, she said, oh, Pauls, you won't believe it. Like, we're really getting taken care of now. They don't throw us out in all the bad conditions. 
you know, it's, it's blown my mind. There's been times where we're having better conditions. So basically I think since the name changed to WSL and they got, you know, a bit, a bigger corporation, right. 